All right. Great, so today's Teach Meet is with, like I said, with Gemma Singleton. She is a science teacher. She is a specialist leader of education for science, and she's currently an assistant head teacher in charge of teaching and learning. She's been a teacher for 17 years. Actually, I'm very happy to have Gemma here because she organized the first Teach Meet that I ever attended. So I'm very happy that she is attending my Teach Meet now. It's like a full cycle thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, like, I don't know, two or three years ago, maybe. I, don't know. Uh, uh, I also want to tell you that all of this will be recorded being on our YouTube channel. So you can watch the video later again, if you want. There is a course on retrieval practice on Seneca. So it's a free CPG course that you can take. It was actually released today, written by Kate Jones. So after here, you can just go straight on to Seneca page and uh, just check the course, it's free, you get a certificate in the end. And our next Teach Meet next week will be with Kate Stockings. You can already sign up for that on our Eventbrite page. She'll be talking about Key Stage 3 curriculum. All right, so I'm gonna let Gemma start right now, whenever you're ready, Gemma. <laughs> okay, um, morning, everybody. Um, I find this really quite weird. Um, I'm, I'm used to sort of presenting to people, but not in my conservatory, sort of just panicking that my dog or my son is going to run through and completely sabotage everything. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, um, yeah, as Flavia said, I've been teaching for 17 years now. Um, I love it. I think it's at the heart of everything that we do within a school. And I think one of the things that's really sort of, I'm not going to say transform my teaching, but has really just enabled learning to take place more effectively is, is looking at retrieval practice. And whenever I sort of go to CPD, look at CPD, I always want to go away with something. I don't want to sit there and go, do you know what? That was really good. It was a nice lunch. It was this, that, or the other. Um, I'm not responsible for lunch today, by the way, that's, that's down to you. Um, but I want to go away with something I can embed in my practice straight away. So I'm going to look at a bit of a bit of a theory behind retrieval practice. That's going to be quite a short bit, but it's more about the resources that um, are out there at the moment that can really, really support retrieval practice in many different guises, rather than just what some people might assume is, is what you have to do for retrieval. So that's where we're going to go. So I'm going to crack on um, because I'm going to try and keep it at, at sort of 25 minutes. So we'll go for that. Oh, here we go. Um, so, like I said, um, I've been teaching quite a while, um, and I love it, I love it, but when I was sort of looking at this to start with, um, I spoke to quite a few of the staff that I've worked with across the years, um, and looked at their approaches to learning, and these are sort of the main, um, the main threads that sort of came out. So looking at an objectives for the classes um, or outcomes, really. Um, getting students to highlight key information, okay. rereading textbooks or notes, um, providing review sheets or supportive material to, to help them, showing videos, um, encouraging students to take their own notes to develop sort of independence, or maybe even lecturing and that direct instruction. Now, I'm not saying any of this is wrong, okay, not at all, but actually, are we considering how we're getting that learning in, or are we just going through these processes because it's what we've always done? So, what I'm going to sort of talk about at the moment, now, all these slides will be available, I'll put them on, um, on my Twitter feed, and you can download them, and look at them, and go through them a bit more, um, a bit more as you've got a lot of time at the moment. Um, so I know some of it might feel quite overwhelming, but I'm just going to try and focus on the key principles. So if we're looking at um, getting the learning in, I think it's really important to understand the cognitive principles behind learning. Um, and there's lots of stuff out there at the moment about metacognition and, and things like that. But actually, I think it's about, do we understand what prior learning our students have had, what experiences they've had, because actually they do have a variety of different experiences 
and exposure to different different aspects of knowledge so what i actually mean by this is cognitive science and I've, i learned a lot about cognitive science through um through seneca through the cogsci work um working group and i just think it's it's fascinating i love learning and um, it does provide us with lots of theories of how learning possibly takes place um, but it's not necessarily concrete for every single every single person um, but it does reflect quite quite clearly how lots of extrinsic factors can directly or indirectly affect students knowledges uh, knowledge or experience which then will sort of map and shape their schema so their schema being how they think and how they apply themselves to different things um, when we're looking at introducing new knowledge, um, the real key point is about starting simple, um, making sure that what that core knowledge is there and then you build to become more complex and more abstract. And I think understanding how ideas can be sequenced really attributes to this. But also not developing their schema on it on their own um, or in isolation because actually that becomes really difficult for students to then recall that and decode that from their long-term memory so how you can then apply powerful explanations to things and linking and building on prior knowledge is really really important so dialogue can be really really effective within this um, and i think when it comes to dialogue it's difficult when you've got 32 students sat in front of you and you're, you you want to find out from all of them that's quite a quite a tough a tough thing to do so building in opportunities where you can see how a student thinks or hear how a student thinks really enables you to unearth any potential misconceptions um, and then you can address it there and then rather than waiting for an assessment or something like that So um, this for me is possibly one of the best books that I've read within teaching. Um, and I've got a, a slide full of references at the end if you, if you guys want to go do a bit more um, research on this. But when we're looking at making it stick, how do we get the learning to stick? A lot of us sometimes, because we are so content driven, um, we just sometimes because we've taught it we've taught it once maybe twice maybe three times we assume that the kids get it and actually many misconceptions can arise with regards to that um, we need to provide opportunities um, for students to recall and retrieve the knowledge that we find fundamental and to make sure that that is really drilled down and the practice enables students to really challenge and strengthen those links between the long term and the working memory so the more opportunities we provide yes it may eat into content time but actually it will save you less time with regards to something like intervention so these i think are some of the misconceptions that can that um arise around retrieval practice so Retrieval practice, people think, oh, it can only happen at the start of the lesson. It can't, it can happen at any point within learning. Um, and you as the teacher know when that is best suited. Um, and there are lots of different ways that, that we can do this. So hopefully I'll share a few strategies today and you can go away and I hope one of them works for you. Um, if you do it more regularly, it's been proven to be um, a lot more effective, especially when you're building it into space and into leave practice. Um, because then you're looking at, at the forgetting curve and you're trying to sort of impede uh, the level of forgetting that's happening. And actually, the, the important thing about this is that it ensures that the, the core components of knowledge um, hopefully are retrieved, are understood, which then means you can leapfrog into the, the deeper conceptual understanding and hopefully long term memory. So these are some of the benefits that I think um, really stand out to me through some of the research, through some of the reading that I've done. Um, retrieval practice really allows students to display their knowledge. Um, and that's vital. That's what you want them to be able to do, because then you can see your next steps as their teacher. Um, 
It also, if we place them into a situation where they are challenged cognitively, where they have to think and they have to think hard, um, that will hopefully strengthen that retrieval, but also identify the gaps. Um, things like low stakes quizzing, recall tests, flash, flashcards, practice problems, writing prompts, sentence stems. These are really powerful tools that can help improve learning and really support um, that student's journey to harnessing that really powerful knowledge. But retrieval does make it challenging um, because it should require a mental effort um, however, at times it, it feels quite hard going, especially if the students are coming up with the same barriers every time. So that's where it can impact on your planning, um, because then you can say, well, actually, this is I need to reteach this. I need to revisit it and go from there. So hopefully it will impact on their longer term memory. However, there are some skeptics and um, the skeptics around them surrounding retrieval practice. Um, just believe that it is memorization and it doesn't necessarily increase understanding however we do need students to to know core knowledge before they can move on to things like ao2 ao3 to apply to new situations to apply to unfamiliar contexts um, and really sort of novel curveball questions so it does allow the, the teacher to um, use a variety of question types um, and to really sort of rank order that thinking and provide a bit of flexibility as well. Now, I'm not one for doing everything for Ofsted, but I think actually it's important to understand how this can link into the new Ofsted criteria. And if we're looking at the three eyes, for example, um, it's about knowledge. It's about that recall of knowledge and learning and looking at that sequencing and retrieval practice and effective retrieval practice can really support um, in all three stages, really, because it's showing what you want them to know, how you're implementing it, as well as looking at the impact across that. Um, it's also um, enabling that conceptual understanding and deeper long term learning, as well as scaffolding particular knowledge and concepts to help uh, students secure learning so that they can make the progress that we need them to make. However, bad habits, bad habits do die hard and we may try this every single lesson, we may try this um, through homework, through really creative ways, but actually it's about training the students in the importance of this um, and training the students understanding that retrieval is an active process it's not a passive process such as rereading notes cramming because actually that gives them confidence but it doesn't necessarily give them the knowledge they need to move on to the next stage um, also it doesn't necessarily um, enable them to be fluent within that within that learning um, just because it comes to mind easily doesn't necessarily mean that they understand it or have learned it successfully so retrieval practice allows you to ask very, very similar questions in many different ways to see whether they have learned it and whether they are becoming fluent. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about not only training our staff, but it's about training the students to see the value in it as well. And um, this is probably the most um, recent book that I, that I absolutely fell in love with. I found it so easy to read. Um, and I found it full of lots and lots of different practical ideas um, that just sort of kept, kept the, um, the sort of brain going with, res with regards to inspiration for resources and things like that. Um, it encourages you to tweak your practice, but also stimulates inspiration of how you can use um, resources in different ways for your students. So um, I would definitely recommend this one, um, but it's, it's fantastic. So the next bit that I'm going to go on to are hopefully the resources. I think this is the bit I'm hoping you're going to find the most useful. Um, all I will say is I've not designed all of these resources. Um, they are resources that I use and that I find the most useful. Lots of them link to science examples. I am really sorry. I've tried to give other examples from different subjects where possible. Um, but um, by no means is it all my own work. But what I will do is I'm going to try and credit as many of the people as, as I possibly can. These are just some of the few 
Twitter practitioners, I would say, that um, really, really support retrieval practice. Now, like I said, this is a handful of, of teachers, but they are so um, generous with regards to their resources and making their resources free and available online. So if you, if you are not following them, I would really recommend that you do because they are absolutely fantastic. So let's start with this one. This is probably the one that you'll be most familiar with with regards to retrieval practice, and that is retrieval roulette. So the idea of this is a quick fire um, series of questions that um, are great for the start of lessons. Um, now, Adam Boxer sort of was the, the creator of this, and um, on his blog, he has got so many different examples of this for many different subjects, um, raising, um, ranging from key stage two all the way up to key stage five in many different subjects. So this one I find the, the easiest one to, to get in, um, usually at the start of a lesson or sometimes at the end of a lesson. Um, and you can really mix it up. It can be random or you can hand pick the questions that you want to want to test the kids on. But that's completely up to you. Retrieval grids um, are an adaptation of retrieval roulette, in, in my opinion. Now, um, the ones on the, the left hand side, the John Cat books, these are great. They're great because they can enable students to become independent. Um, they can be done at home. Um, they can be done at the end of a topic, they can be done at the beginning of a topic, um, and you can give the students these to just to check whether they're grasping that core knowledge. I think they're great. I, I absolutely love using them with my students, and students get a lot, of, a lot of reward from them, especially when they can repeat the quizzes and go on. Um, the one by Kate on the right-hand side, um, again, I, I love and I use this quite a lot. And I like this because actually, if you look at the key at the bottom, last lesson, two weeks ago, last month, way back, it just gives students that element of competition. Um, but as well, it's, it's looking at that retrieval of, of that, that prior learning and seeing whether or not they're still making those connections. So it's bringing it back to the forefront of the memory. Um, silent self-quizzing. Now, this one, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I found it really, really hard. And um, it's more a case of the silence. Sometimes students feel quite, quite un, uneasy with it. But actually, once students can see the, the importance of this, um, they can generate their answers quite quickly, quite, um, but also privately. And what's really nice about this is the answers stay with them. And they, you're teaching them to become more independent, you're teaching them to self-assess, um, and the process is about the outcome and the students understanding what they can do to improve that outcome. So examples of this could be flashcards, um, getting students to make flashcards and then getting them to revisit that in silence. Um, also, you could get them to give them a picture of a particular thing to label, and just getting them to go over that two, three times over a week or two, and then bringing it back two months later. Um, what that then allows you to do is look at the common errors and the problems. So what I get to do, for example, with the, the brain at the bottom, I'll get students to label the brain, um, and I'll, they can self-assess it, but I get them to self-assess in a different color so I can see what, they, what they're getting wrong. Then what we'll do is we'll do it again a couple of weeks later, and we'll see if they've got if they've made improvements and i think it's just about bringing that to the forefront of their mind and that's by that's something that tom sherrington really advocates with regards to retrieval paired quizzing as well um, now what i really like about this is dylan william um, really sort of explains how other students and activating other students as a resort is is really underused within our classrooms now that could be due to behavior, it could be due to teach confidence, I don't know. But we could prepare particular uh, material for the students, um, questions and answers, so they can, they can practice against each other. Um, and then what we do is we give the students, a um, the this gives the teacher the opportunity to circulate and listen to the dialogue and possibly address any misconceptions. Um, Another aspect of this is turn and talk or just a minute. And it's asking students to 
turn and talk for one minute on a previous learning topic without any hesitation, repetition or deviation. Now, I tried this and it went horrifically wrong um, because actually the students need to be trained and they need to be able to practice. So what I've done since, I've not given up on it, um, but the idea is we've just put more scaffolding prompts within um, to enable students to really talk talk for 30 seconds and then we're building it up to a minute. Because not only does it develop oracy, um, but it gives students the confidence to talk about it and then hopefully we'll see that improvement when they're writing things down. Um, Self-explanation. I really enjoy this one. Um, and this is the one that um, I picked up from the COGSI um, presentation um, at Westminster School and by Adam Robbins. And he just sort of dropped, dropped the goal free effect in and it sort of made so much sense in my mind. So it's the idea of this diagram here, this is diagram of a leaf. And this is what I used to give my students. So I'm like, right, label the leaf. And actually, lots of them could eventually do that. Brilliant. What I've then done is actually not given them that and I've given them this diagram instead. So there's no labels on this, but I've just asked them to tell me as much information about that diagram as they can. So I'm not necessarily limiting their knowledge to um, just the labels that I want them to do. They could go on to talk about photosynthesis, they could go on to talk about chloroplast, they could go on to talk about particular adaptations of, of aspects of that leaf. And I think actually allow them to self-regulate their responses a little bit more. Um, and actually just gives them the opportunity to show what they know. Now, the goal-free effect has been really successful with, within maths or within data questions. So for example, rather than giving a targeted question about this particular graph, you could actually say, tell me what you know about this graph, and you'll probably get a much richer answer um, with regards to this. And then you can focus on the exam technique with the specific questions. Um, now, I read, um, I read Adam's blog about uh, the hinterland and the narrative structure that, that stories can bring um, and sometimes how they can mislead them away from the actual knowledge that you want them to know. But actually, I think with some really difficult concepts, um, telling a story around a particular thing can be really, really helpful and it can aid retrieval and you can get students to tell stories around particular concepts as well. Now, for science, you've got, for example, uh, Bill Wilkinson. Bill Wilkinson has curated lots and lots of different stories um, linked to science. Um, this is one of my favourites. It's the Radiation Girls. So this one here is the Radiation Girls. And it talks about their efforts in, in radiation and Chernobyl and things like that. And it, it linked perfectly to when I was teaching about radioactivity and the dangers. Um, you could quite simply give them an image. So this is an image, for example, that I picked up from an art lesson. Um, we do a monster calls in uh, year seven in English, and they've linked up with art. And now art just gave them this image and got them to tell the story of the image, just to see what knowledge they can bring in. Um, and I just think it's a really different way of looking at retrieval. Um, this one is, is quite classic, I think. So demonstration or performance. Now I'm not talking about performances in role play or, or anything like that. I'm talking about actually what can the students do and what can they show you? Um, and I think this is really quite nice when we look at the I do, we do, you do with regards to modeling. Um, because actually if you want them to be able to demonstrate um, not just declarative knowledge, um, but maybe procedural knowledge, this demonstration or performance really fits in with the you do aspect of, of this scaffolding technique. Um, so I think it's quite a nice one, but also it's massively supported by the different types of questions you can ask. So if we can sort of get students to elaborate or interrogate um, their own schema and explore it that bit more, we can hopefully understand how they're thinking and, and potentially unearth misconceptions and address them. Um, I think visualizers really, really support retrieval um, because it allows the students to focus on the questions. 
So, for example, the diagram on there, this, is, this was an example of the leaf that we used with our students. And these were all the questions that we were asking around it to see what they understood. Um, summarising and mapping. Um, this is a firm favourite of mine. It's not necessarily a firm favourite of all of my students. Um, but actually, it's a process that allows the students to recall what's happened. So actually, it's their schema on a particular concept or topic on one page. Um, however, what I have found with, with this aspect of retrieval is you've got to be specific in what you expect. Because actually, you might get kids spending six hours on a title and there is no, there's no knowledge being retrieved. Um, however, mapping and comparing gives you that bit more depth. And it allows you to see what they remember, but how they can possibly link between concepts. So it's taking retrieval to the next step. Um, it encourages a quality dialogue, either between pairs, if you can train the students in that way, or between the student and the teacher. Um, and it also can be used as a way to really encourage students to justify why they think that way um, and potentially solidify links. So this is a way that they can do it and start making those conceptual links between topics. Um, think black and plan forward. Um, Mark Enzer advocates this um, and uh, I've read the, not necessarily making geography count, I've read the making science lesson count, making every lesson count, and it does, it does just do that. It's the idea of picking specific topics, so it's, a, it's enabling you to plan the, the types of questions that you need students to be able to answer um, that will apply to this lesson. So it's looking at that prior learning um, to enable them to be successful in the current learning. And I think this leads beautifully on to analyse this as a resource. So you could, for example, show pupils an image of something. Um, this is an example in one of our subjects. So you could then give them very clear questions to prompt um, or to consider to get them thinking back to what they've previously been taught. Now, this could really include questions about chronology or about processes. So you can really unpick whether students under, understand the processes and, and how to do those processes in a logical or methodical order. Um, these tend to be more open-ended questions um, to use a wider, a wider range of understanding um, and knowledge rather than just the drill type classic retrieval questions. So it's taking that a bit further, but it's still coming into that bracket of actually you've got to uh, use your prior knowledge. Dual coding now, this, this is, I love it. I love it when um, Oliver Caviglioli um, put this out there and I absolutely love the idea of combining verbal materials with, with visual materials. And there are lots and lots of different ways and you see on Twitter all the time, loads of people just being really sort of experimental um, asking for feedback, asking to improve. Um, and I really, really like it. Um, but what I think we've got to consider when it comes to dual coding is, firstly, what are our current materials, okay? Um, do we compare our visuals to words? Do we even have visuals on there? Um, consider, are they appropriate? Are they too overwhelming? Are they cognitively challenging? Are they actually going to support the retrieval of the desired material? Um, because actually, if they're not, then they're not fit for purpose. Can you draw your own visuals to aid learning? Can you get students to draw their own materials to aid learning? Some will, will be really, really happy to do that. Others, really, really not. Um, and actually, can you get them to a point where they don't have to draw the visuals, but they, they can see a visual and they're understanding the process to write that down? So it's about linking that back to the actual skills that they're going to need to be successful. Now, these are just three examples that, that I absolutely love um, and that work for my subject. There are lots, and I'm sure you've got far more examples than I have, but timelines. This for me, the history of an atom is a classic one. And it's about looking, the key thing here is about looking at those models on the timeline to how it has changed. And then it's the fact that students are linking that into um, the scientists that did that. Um, this one I love, and I absolutely love Grace's um, 
drawings i think they're phenomenal they're far better than than i can do um but the clarity within such a difficult topic here with with immunology and and how immunity actually happens is beautiful and actually it allows the students to go through step one step two step three four five um, and really offer an explanation even if they they kind of don't have a clue initially so i think the the simplicity and the beauty of that is fantastic um, then you've got um, the two Adams and Louise, um, all are willing to share their visual hexagons. Now the idea here is you've got a topic or you've got a question in the middle and these visuals will support the students learning that they can write about how that links to that particular topic or concept. And I just think this, that's a really easy way that's non-threatening to get that into students um, and enable students to have a go. Um, Connect Four. Now, this is the one that I used to tend. I tend to use more for Key Stage Five, and it's sort of giving students four seemingly uh, disparate topics um, and getting them to find as many links as they can between them. Because with this, they've got to build on their prior knowledge. So it's about those links, and it's about actually how can they justify the links between those topics. You can then look at misconceptions, and you can look at actually that's not quite right. And it really allows you to interrogate the schema again. Um, you've also got, I don't know what that is on the wall, but hey. And you've also got a find and fix. Now, this again is what Louise Cass has put together. And I, I just love them. Um, it really, this is more focusing on the uh, common misconceptions and really allows you to challenge students thinking um, through giving them questions and getting them to find the mistakes and fix the mistakes. So these are great for use after an assessment, or you can just generally do them at the end of a topic before you do an assessment, so to allow the students to be more successful. Okay. Um, but so those are the strategies. But I think these will, and I'm being I'm being really honest with regards to this. I think these will only work if, firstly, we evaluate the learning, and um, we make careful informed decisions about how and when to retrieve um, and what our subsequent actions from that will be so the, are we going to revisit it are we going to revise it are we going to reteach it um, because actually we've got to understand how our students are learning feedback is essential now i'm not talking about written feedback i'm talking about are you are you giving students feedback on the process on the questions because it is essential without understanding where they where they've gone wrong where the potential gaps are where the misconceptions are they're not going to be addressed within that student schema and they're going to continue to make the same the same errors each time um what we've got to do as the practitioner is provide opportunities for both retrieval and feedback to happen um, and that's about building into the curriculum planning. It's about the sequencing, especially when we know about common misconceptions. And it's about really harnessing that quite, quite importantly. Also, it's about tapping into the intrinsic motivation of how successful learning feels. Um, extrinsic motivation only works up to a certain point, but it's, nothing beats that feeling when a, when a student gets it and they understand it that promotes confidence that will drive progress to that next level so it's about tapping into that where possible and finally it's about ensuring um, explanations are are powerful um, that they're clear that they are of high quality um, and where possible address those misconceptions in the first instance and don't be afraid to revisit them over and over again because actually that's going to strengthen the new schematic links um, that are being built so I think that's really important now I'm not going to go through this slide but this is just more of um, a way of a summary um, and what you can do if you want to take this back to your teams um, but I just think it's quite nice um, and it makes it workable because actually a lot of this is good teaching um, and you're probably already on it you probably understand actually it will reaffirm everything that you're doing is probably right but the idea is is just retrieve it build opportunities for that 
um, and enable students to really figure out what they do and don't know and, and provide um, more instances where you can, you can go on for that. Um, and then my final slide is just the references. So if you do want to go through and go into a bit more detail about any of, any of the retrieval practices, these are some of the journals and books that, that I've read. Um, but yeah, if you want to delve a little bit deeper, feel free. So that's me, that's done. I'm sorry for all the sound issues. Uh, Gemma, thank you. No, the sound issues were only on the first two minutes, then it was perfect. We could hear you okay. brilliantly. <laughs> Uh, can you stop sharing your screen, please? So yep. we can ask you questions. I will figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will bring your video back. Uh, oh, hang on, I have to bring you back. <laughs> it's okay. How to do that? No, hang on, I do know how to do that. Wait, uh, just have to find you on my start video. Okay, I think you have to go on start video again. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Brilliant. Fantastic. Okay, great. So everybody's saying thank you. Now you can look at the chat if you want. But oh, no. I have, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think it was really, really interesting and very practical. I think that's something that teachers always value you have the theory but you also have like actual what can I do on Monday ideas uh, so I gathered a few questions from people on the during the chat so I'm gonna ask you some of them now so a few things on uh, the very beginning when you were talking about thinking styles and how students think in the classroom how do you know what students are thinking? How do you know how they're thinking? Do you have any ways of checking? For that? um, that's, that's a really good question. And to be fair, you don't always know what students are thinking, um, yeah. especially when you've got quite introverted students. Um, so it's about just looking and building different opportunities um, to sort of see what they think. So um, you could get them, for example, what we do at the start of every new topic is we have what we call a challenge question. Yeah. Um, and that's a very open ended question where um, students write what they know. Um, it's very non threatening. It's we give them feed. We give them whole class feedback um, about any possible misconceptions that arise. Um, and I think we've trialed that this year and it works incredibly well. And we've done that with year seven all the way up to year 11. Um, and then we revisit that challenge question part way through a unit um, or for key stage three, we visit it um, part way through a half term. And then we revisit it at the very, very end once all learning for that particular module has taken place. Okay. And we've seen that build up of knowledge um, over time, really. So, yeah, it's not easy. But I think the, the main things to unearth what a student is thinking is providing different opportunities. So even if it's like, tell me what you know about this and give them a blank piece of paper or put um, a title or a question in the middle of a page or through a really effective questioning. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there were some questions about the curriculum. So these are all really great ideas, but there's a lot to cover on the CSC and A levels in the curriculum. So how can you make sure that you're doing retrieval practice, interleaving, spacing, and also covering all the topics that you need to cover? Definitely. Um, I, I think I teach science and I think that is one of the, the largest curriculums um, um, out there. And it is about balance. It's about understanding when you're sequencing those lessons, what, what is fundamental um, about the retrieval that needs to allow them to be successful for the next phase. So it's, that may be different for the cl every class that you have. Um, and that's where the challenges arise. Um, but actually, if you are, what I would say is collaboratively look at that with your teams, because actually you will get, when you've got lots of divergent thinkers around one table about a particular curriculum, you, you'll get, you'll think, oh, I didn't think of that. I didn't understand that bit. And I think it's about looking at it more collaboratively rather than in isolation, because that's when you can look at 
where I would always say start with where the misconceptions arise most frequently and you start with those because what you'll ultimately find is that's the one you'll be coming back to week after week after week in things like intervention or revision so it's about tackling it where you can but that's about you because you're the experts you understand your children better than anybody else stood in front of them so it's about about doing that per class sometimes and that would be an effective use of department time yeah agree uh so following up on that i have two questions first of them is how important is it to have retrieval practice as like a school policy where everybody does it is it should every teacher be doing the same strategies or does it matter or can everybody do the same thing and the second question is um on exams uh, they were talking about uh, different abilities so you have AO1, AO2, AO3 how much do you think retrieval practice helps with analysis and more um, higher level skills? right so I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle the, the second question first right it's really difficult for my brain to get around uh, <laughs> so I think with regards to when you're looking at exam practice retrieval practice it can massively support knowledge if the kids don't know anything, how are they going to apply knowledge to um, different situations or unfamiliar contexts? So if they don't understand knowledge, they will find that really, really difficult to access things like AO2, AO3. So I think if they've got that really solid foundation of knowledge, which retrieval practice really supports, then actually transitioning to the other um, assessment objectives, hopefully will be will be easier. Um, with regards to whole school policies, um, I think that really depends on your school. <laughs> That's a really cop out answer. Um, but um, I'll give an example of the school that I'm, that I'm at. Um, we do um, a five a day quiz, a retrieval quiz at the start of every single lesson. Every subject does that. Um, the students are so routine that if it doesn't appear for whatever reason, they're sort of saying, <laughs> Um, and we've got a really structured format for that um, because we're about challenging um, education. We're about getting students to buy into education. Um, so we do retrieval practice at the start of every lesson. Um, but whether that's a whole school policy or not, I think it's, it's more you understanding where it fits in in the sequence of your learning and to make it the most effective so i think if we start then making it policies it becomes a tick box activity and people stop seeing the significance of that and actually the significance of it is getting students to understand and getting them to understand the core knowledge to enable them to be successful yeah brilliant um in terms of misconceptions you mentioned that a lot yeah uh so i heard that from i think it was Ephra first who said that retrieval practice makes it stronger it doesn't necessarily make it perfect so if they are retrieving the misconceptions they just get there more and more stronger in their heads so how do you make sure that they are not retrieving the wrong thing that's really that is really tough um because misconceptions can arise from from anywhere yeah. and um it's, i just find it absolutely fascinating how misconceptions seem to stick really really quite quite easily and quite yeah. fundamentally um, and then that schema becomes really difficult to break. And I think for, for, some, for somebody like me within science, it's about providing the explanation as to why it is not that. So yes, you do need to see how the students are thinking. So when you unearth those misconceptions, you can see that they're thinking that respiration is breathing, classic one for us. Um, but actually it's about showing them why that is not the case. And then just revisiting that with the student about why is respiration not breathing? Can you explain that? And it's about building that new link and hopefully causing the other, the other link to, to fade a little bit. But that's, it's really hard, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, there's one more question about different students. So people have raised the questions about um, students with special education needs, low ability students, the students who lack motivation, you talked about intrinsic motivation, uh, and then in general, different key stages. Yeah. Uh, do you think those strategies that you mentioned, they work for almost everybody, or should we have specific strategies for different students or different key stages? 
I think um, with any with any resource or any of the strategies that I've, I've spoken about, um, you need to make you need to make that informed judgment about those kids sat in front of you. Um, for me, I found the ones that work best with, um, let's say, for example, my lower attaining students or my um, students with uh, SEND needs tend to be things like the visual hexagons. Um, because actually it's not a blank page and they're willing to give it a go because the visuals really prompt dual coding as well really supports that that aspect of scaffolding mm -hmm. so yes it doesn't matter where your starting point is but you can go further and further but I think the one that will translate into any age um, attainment um, need is is effective questioning retrieval practice is massively underpinned by effective questioning and, and feedback yeah uh, so how do you know retrieval practice is working how do you know that students are learning from me do you have so they asked if you have like actual grading system for that or is it just all low stake quizzing how do you make sure that that's working so i think with um with if we're looking solely at retrieval practice the idea that um when we're looking at quizzing that it is low stakes i think the minute you start putting grades on there, um, it, it turns it more high stakes and actually it, that can be a little bit more detrimental. Um, the idea of them self-assessing or peer assessing really al allows that, that intrinsic motivation to build because they can see themselves getting five out of five or 10 out of 10 or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but we don't necessarily assign a grade to that. I think the the greatest way that I see my students learning is through questioning. I really plan to target as many questions to as many students as I can in a lesson um, because that allows me to, to see. Um, but also through mini assessments, through homeworks, through things like that. So I think it's about encompassing the whole package because we can't just say, right, we've done this task. Oh, it didn't work. I think it's about more that regular um, running of retrieval practice yeah great i agree <laughs> and uh they were asking about more practical subjects but i guess they also works for the experimental bit of science so does retrieval practice help with procedural memory like music and pe and the practicals in science i, th I think so like um I, 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 I wish I could talk about music and things um i you know what i mean i could play the piano for <laughs> good um <laughs> not so much anymore um, but with regards to to science and when we're looking at the practicals um definitely we could we could put a tray of equipment and we could say right we want you to set this practical up and we can see um the procedural thinking behind it we could get students to write a six point step-by-step -step method so that not only looks at how to do something but it's looking at actually the the logical order and does it make sense um for subjects like drama and things like that i think it's it's more reliant on that that vital dialogue so i think that's where the retrieval practice comes in more effectively through okay. um music art pe it's about that that discussion based and and that's not a bad thing because actually we don't need them writing for the sake of it but it's more about seeing what they know what they understand and addressing that where possible yeah uh, what about knowledge organizers people are interested to see if you use them if you like them if you don't like them i'm i'm not adverse to a knowledge <laughs> organizer actually i quite like them um we we do use them at our school we have um what's called a book of knowledge um so we have one for year seven eight nine ten and eleven um which is all the knowledge organizers that they will will have throughout the year as well as their their curriculum journeys for sort of each subject so they know exactly where they're going um, i think knowledge organizers are they're good they're a they're a resource and i think people rely too heavily on them being being much more than that um, what i really like to do with knowledge organizers is i tend to set homework questions regarding the knowledge organizers um, to and i i section them off in a way that um, right this for the next three lessons i want you to focus on section one because that's that's the bit that we're going to be focusing on right your next homework we're going to be set, we're focusing on section two so it just it supports the chunking of of learning as well 
Um, but yeah, I like them. I, th I think students, some students like them. I think some students don't. Um, so yeah, it's the, the issue with them is they can be cognitively overloaded, but I think it really depends on you showing the students how to use them effectively. So what I really like is when we're coming up to the revision aspect of it is blanking sections out so they can, they can practice retrieval of, of their key knowledge there. Yeah. So speaking about uh, cognitive overload, you mentioned uh, using dual coding, which I also have to say, Oliver Caviglioli wrote a CPD course for Seneca. It's free. Just go on the website and hear it from the man himself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my question was uh, do you have like an actual check to see whether it's too much for students how do you define in your practice what's good dual coding and what's too much um if i'm being if i'm being completely transparent and honest honest i think sometimes it's about um trial and error um so I'll give, a, I'll give a really good example of one where I thought um, I was teaching IVF and the stages of IVF. And I just, I thought, right, let's go. So I taught them through, we did lots yeah. and lots of diagrams to really help them. Um, and then I gave them a, a question just, and it was very simple. It was outline the steps of IVF. And students got one or two marks on that particular question. Um, and that really threw me because I actually thought that I made it easier for them, but I think I just overloaded them with, with information, talking, diagrams, um, words. So the next lesson I came back and we just, we, we, I practiced it that night and drew it out really simply. Mm -hmm. And I just said, right, here is a picture, state what is happening. And I didn't speak. And I, that allowed them to just focus 10 minutes on the pictures and students were more successful. So I think it's about trial and error, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. That makes total sense. Um, so you mentioned a few books uh, yeah. during your talk and you have, uh, everybody has access to the PowerPoints. You're gonna share the PowerPoint, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So on the last slide you have all the, the list, but do you have any one that you think if you're going to start, I've never done retrieval practice properly in my class and I want to start, what do you think would be like the best book or the best podcast or the best resource to have? I think, I think the, the simplest one to read and get inspiration from is yeah. Kate Jones. Um, I just think it's a, it's a nice thin book. Um, it will prompt ideas. It will get your, your brain firing. Um, or it did mine anyway. I hopefully it will for you. Um, that's the one I, I really enjoyed reading, um, and it inspired me to create quite a lot of resources for my students. Yeah. Um, but the one that I love the most is making it stick. I just yeah. think it's brilliant. Yeah. Just makes sense. Yeah, I mean it's a perfect title as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm gonna say that Seneca also has a free CPG course written by Kate Jones. So just go for it we have everything and uh, hopefully maybe we'll have one written by Gemma at some point if you're we'll, we'll interested see. <laughs> we'll see we'll see um I think that's most of the questions that I got uh people are thanking I think that was really really great Gemma so really really helpful okay. uh guys we're gonna be here for another five minutes if somebody has another question just please just type on the chat uh if not, I just want to thank you, everybody, for coming and joining. Sorry for the beginning, uh, the mistakes in the end or the problems with the sounds. But we fixed it and it was perfect. So thank you very much, Gemma, as well. I hope you enjoyed. It was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it's really uh, nice seeing lots of, lots of Twitter faces rather yeah. than just Twitter handles. It's quite nice. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Actually, they want to know your Twitter handle so they can follow you. Oh, it's um, at Mrs. Singleton. Mrs. Singleton. Great. And uh, do you have any other way to contact you? Because some people don't have Twitter. Um, what I'll do is on the PowerPoint, Yeah. Um, I'll put my email address as well, uh, my school email address. So if you, if you want to talk anything, if you want to share resources, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, brilliant. Right, and the last thing that I just have to say is that next week we have
Kate Stocking. She even shared the link to her Eventbrite page. Very well done, Kate. Uh, we're going to have her talking about Key Stage 3 curriculum. So if you are interested in that or just curriculum in general, come and join the next, CPD, next Teach Meet next week. And I think we're going to start. Yeah, I think we've answered all the questions. So thank you very much, Gemma, and everybody. Have a good day.